welcome to the final session of True Woman 201 Interior Design. Throughout this series, we've studied essential design elements of biblical womanhood as outlined in Titus chapter two. What makes a woman attractive? Is it stylish hair, flawless skin, a great figure, fashionable clothing? The Bible has the answer. It tells us who defines beauty, where it comes from, and exactly what it is that makes a woman beautiful. So if you wanna have a wow factor that outdoes the images portrayed in the grocery checkout glossy magazines, then listen in as Nancy and I chat about the final element, which is beauty. Well, for those who've been listening to this conversation we've been having, Mary, nobody can imagine <laughs> except us all that we've been through to pull together this shoot. And it's been days here of wardrobe issues, challenges, matching our clothes. We have very different styles, mm -hmm. hair and makeup and set and context. And I, br I brought mostly red clothes. You bro brought mostly pink. <laughs> so that that not, trying to put those that together. That did not work very well. <laughs> so I'm saying the next series we do, I think should be called Authentic Womanhood. Uh -huh. We have no makeup. We wear the same outfit the whole time. What do you think? We'll get just as many complaints, I'm sure. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> but it is amazing how we all want to be beautiful. Mm. And the lengths that we will go to in order to make ourselves presentable. And we've experienced a little bit of that over these last days. And I think that God has wired us as women to have a desire for beauty. And that's not a bad thing. It's, it's perhaps can be misguided sure. when it's all put on external beauty. But I think that that's part of our wiring is, is to love beauty. And as we come to the end of this series, that's a really important word because mm -hmm. we want to see that the true woman displays the attractiveness of the gospel. Mm -hmm. In fact, Titus says she adorns the gospel. Uh, we're, we've been looking at this passage in Titus 2, and it gives us three so that uh, clauses mm -hmm. in the, these instructions to men and women and uh, different demographics in the church. Yep. And after talking about older women, uh, training younger women. It says, so that the word of God may, may not, not be, be reviled. reviled. And then it says in verse eight, so that an opponent may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Mm -hmm. And then that verse 10, I love, so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God, our savior. And that's the point. That is the point. How we do life, how we do life day to day, how we do life as a woman adorns the gospel of Jesus Christ can make it beautiful, makes it beautiful or it makes it ugly. It, yeah, right. it, it shows it to be unattractive. I mean, the gospel is beautiful. The gospel Christ is, is beautiful, beautiful, but we affect how others view Christ and the gospel. Exactly. And as we've looked at these different elements, these that we find in Titus too, and we've explored them, we've studied them, we've put them under the microscope. I think it's important to say at the close here that when you let the grand designer, God himself into your life, mm -hmm. let him have his way and begin to shape and reshape that what he does, the work he does, first of all, it's functional. Yes. It works. Life works better when you let it work according to the way it was designed to exactly. work. Yeah. But it doesn't just work better. No, it's also beautiful. And I think that that's something both you and I have come to appreciate over the years. I know that as a young believer, younger believer, as a younger woman, that I, did, I, I, I always thought God's word was right. I had a sense that it was true and that God was God and that I wasn't God. So I had a, a basic respect for God's word. But I know when I bumped up against passages like this about womanhood, I just had this sense this emotional response to it that yes oh I'll do it God's way is right but it took many years before I actually came to to really an appreciation to saying you know what it's not only good and right it's also beautiful yeah, it is. And I've been on much the same journey myself. And some of these passages, especially about womanhood, that rub the culture the wrong way. Mm -hmm. They rub our own flesh the wrong way. I've been rubbed the wrong way, way by some of these passages. As we've worked through them. Mm -hmm. And yet when you see how God how they bring freedom, how they bring blessing, how this is for our protection. You begin to see these ways of God really are beautiful. They're mm -hmm. good. They're beautiful. And as we embrace them, our lives become beautiful and become a beautiful reflection of God whose beauty 
we've been embracing. And we adorn the gospel. Yeah. Yeah. And that's an amazing phrase. I love that phrase. And uh, there's another uh, phrase here in this passage that kind of hints at that a little bit. And last, in last session, we talked about older women teaching the younger women Th to teach them good things. And actually the word in there is good and beautiful things. It, it, there's, there's an aspect of attractiveness about what we are transmitting to the next generation. So the idea of beauty is contained in there as well. So I think our presentation as older women, uh, as we talked about legacy in the last session, mm -hmm. we want to be uh, presenting to these younger women a vision of biblical womanhood that is winsome, it is compelling, yes. and sometimes I think they've rejected something that they've never seen how beautiful it really is. Exactly. And they've just rejected it because, because of this emotional response of, of really how we've been conditioned to think by culture that, that a woman who is... is um, amenable, a woman who has a soft dis disposition, that that's an ugly thing or, or that's a weak woman. That's how we've been trained to, be th to think as women in this culture, but that's uh, not truth according to God's word. So the scripture says that as we behold Christ and his beauty, mm -hmm. we take on his likeness. We are transformed into that same image. We're changed from glory to glory, 2 yeah. Corinthians 3 says. And then our lives reflect to those around us, to our families, to in the workplace, in the church, reflect the beauty and the wonder of who Christ is. And they say, I want to know him. Mm -hmm. I want to be more like mm -hmm. him. And then together we become this beautiful bride for Christ, mm -hmm. uh, whose bride we are. Now, speaking of beauty, there's a beautiful image in the Old Testament, Psalm 144. It's the first planet in there that I, I think just, it gives us a great word picture of what God's wanting to do through biblical manhood and womanhood. So let's talk about that for a moment. Psalm 144 verse 12 says, may our sons in their youth be like plants full grown and our daughters like corner pillars cut for the structure of a palace. Now, on first reading, that seems a little strange. Uh, why are sons supposed to be like plants and why are daughters supposed to be like pillars for a palace? Help it us out. It does seem a little strange, doesn't it? But the word of God likens sons as being strong and, and growing and growing strong. But this, this image for women, for the daughters is fascinating. I find it fascinating because I don't know if you've ever been to Greece, but yeah. when I went to Greece, there, there's this uh, porch in, that has been preserved Preserved from ancient Greece, and the pillars of the porch are actually uh, figures of women, marble cut, beautiful women dressed in these uh, lovely flowing garments, and their their hair braided, and the uh, on their heads there sits the top of the porch. So so the weight of the porch is actually supported on their heads. And this is the kind of image I believe that David is referring to, that, that this was popular at that time, and that these may may our daughters grow up to be like that. So that is a powerful image because this is not a, an image, it is an image of beauty. It's an image of incredible beauty, but it's also an image of strength. Yes. And it's a foundational image. So when women are living according to God's design, when we get this and when we begin to live it out in our lives, it's foundational and it's foundational for the structure. It's foundational for the structure of the home and it's foundational for the structure of society. And not only do we beautify things as women, but we also give them strength and give structure in terms of, of, of the family structure and the way God has designed things to be. Yeah, there's a sense of stability mm. that women can give to a culture, to their home, to their community by being women of God by living out their God created design, one godly woman in a home exactly. can be that pillar. Can make a difference. I want to read this quote, and it's a quote by the 19th century British pastor John Angle James. And here's a portion of it. It is it's so powerful. Every woman, by her virtue or her vice, by her folly or her wisdom, by her levity or her dignity, is adding something to our national elevation or degradation. A community is not likely to be overthrown where woman fulfills her mission, for by the power of her noble heart over the hearts of others, she will raise that community from its ruins and restore it again to prosperity and joy. Women are such powerful influencers, such powerful influencers.
And I've heard people say things like, if I were going to decide whether or not to be a Christian by looking at that person who calls himself a Christian, I wouldn't be interested. Mm. And it makes me wonder, do our lives create hunger and thirst uh, among those who don't know Christ, yeah. among yeah. the next generation to say, I want that Christ. I think of a, a woman who brought her husband to church. Actually, it, it was a baptism in my church a few weeks ago. And the man got up and said that his wife had come to the Lord before he had. And that it was just the transformation in her life. And she didn't say a thing to him. But it was just the change, the radical change in her life that really drew him to Christ. And, and it was the beauty that he saw coming to the surface as she began to be transformed into the image of Jesus that drew him to Christ. So we see it on the negative way, but we yes. also see it the positive yes. way where when, when we shine that light of Christ and when we work out these 10 elements in our lives, that it is attractive. And more and more, I think, as we see more family breakdown, more breakdown, more confusion in terms of gender and identity, more people wrestling with these things, more pornography, more, more evil all around mm -hmm, us. Mm -hmm. The more we see that, the more I think that Christ's light will shine through us as we do life according to his design. And this is really where we started out in Titus too. Mm. Paul is saying that in this context of this fallen culture in which they lived, yeah. Nero's Roman empire, the persecution against believers, the rampant, flagrant immorality, the um, false doctrine, the false teaching, many false religions that were much more prominent than Christianity mm -hmm. at the time. Yeah. And um, Paul was saying, how do you survive as and a thrive and thrive in this kind of world? And how do you, how do we draw people to Christ? Mm -hmm. And what he comes back to again and again is that our lives, whether men or women, young or old, are supposed to look radically different than the rest of the world. Mm. And if we're just fitting in, assimilating into the culture, just being talking and acting and thinking and being like everyone else, the world's not interested in that kind of Christianity. No. And that's when Paul says in Titus 2 that the word of God will actually be, the word in our translation is reviled, but it's a word that means to be blasphemed. Mm. People will actually reject Christ and Christianity if they see us professing something that we but don't live out, living it out, but not living it out, but yeah. not living it out. Now, as we think about this whole thing of beauty, if we're talking about beautifying the gospel, about being a radiant bride of Christ for the world to be drawn to him. Uh, but I think there's also this issue of as women, this craving for beauty, this mm -hmm. longing for beauty. And there's kind of a push pull because um, we say, you know, cultivate the inner beauty that Peter talks about in 1 Peter chapter 3, a gentle and quiet spirit. Uh, but what about the external? Is it meaningless? Does it matter at all? Is it okay to think about it? How should we think about it? Well, I, I always think that what we see in the physical realm points us to the spiritual realm. And scripture draws these parallels and it, it, it talks in metaphors often. So when it talks about being pure, it talks about a bride keeping her dress pure. So that's something that in the natural realm, a bride does. She, she's fussy about her dress. She wants to keep it spotless. She wants to look beautiful. She wants to present herself to her groom looking just as great as she can. And the Bible doesn't condemn that, but it calls us higher than that. It calls us to the reality to which that earthly temporary reality points. And that is the bride of Christ and keeping ourselves spiritually pure and spotless so that we may be beautiful for our savior. So as we think about these 10 elements that we've looked at, I wanna just walk through those real briefly and refresh our memory as to what they are. And then just remind each other that these things are not only true and right, but that they are good and beautiful. and beautiful. So we started out with discernment. Mm -hmm. Discernment, learning how to think correctly in every aspect according to sound doctrine and talked about that right thinking leads to right living and oh, how we need discernment in our culture. We have all these messages that are pushed and these messages that tell us who we are and how we ought to behave as women. And we need to be women of the word, women of discernment who use God's word as the plumb line in our lives. And then we talked about honor or reverence. Mm, that word reverence just holds 
holds so much meaning and, and really is the linchpin, the, the pivot point of a lot of these things, that what we think of Christ, if we make much of Christ, less of ourselves and more of Christ, we are going to live in a way that is beautiful. We're going to treat people well. We're going to speak well. We're going to uh, have a lot of things fall into place in our lives simply when we have that awareness that Jesus is always there. And that reverence for Christ is a good and a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. We talked about family affection, Mm. loving husbands, loving children, especially your own, and esteeming God's family plan. And that's a good and a beautiful thing. And a thing that's just as important for singles as marriage. Yes, yes. Mm. And then the area of discipline, that was a hard one for me. Self-control. Making those wise choices, those intentional choices and being self-controlled and and how that brings joy. And that also is a good and beautiful thing. And then there was virtue, Mm. purity. You don't hear that word virtue very often. We need to hear it more. And our world says that virtue is not that attractive. The world despises virtue. It despises virtue. But those who despise virtue often are the ones who end up with the heartache and the pain, unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. So we need to remind each other that virtue is a good and a beautiful thing. Mm. We also talked about responsibility, work priorities, deciding what, uh, what sort of work takes emphasis at this age in my life, this stage in my life where I am, uh, whether I have family, children, husband, How do I decide? And also the priority of the home, just how important it is and how we can use our home as a ministry base to teach others about uh, our home, our Heavenly Father's home and what it means to be part of the family of God. That's a good and beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. Then we looked at benevolence or kindness, being kind, being charitable toward others and it's obvious that that is a good and beautiful thing. It's in mm-hmm. short supply. We need lots more of it. We hardly need to say that. Everyone yearns for that. Yes. But disposition, that's another one where, where the world gives us a lot of pushback, where, where the, the word of God tells us that a soft and amenable, a submissive spirit in, in a woman is a womanly thing, and it's a good and beautiful thing. And then we talked in the last session about legacy spiritually mothering uh, younger women, teaching those who are coming up behind us. And that is a good and a beautiful thing. And Mm. so needed, uh, not just to take in these things we've been talking about and become a beautiful woman ourselves, but to be interested in helping that next generation uh, follow in those steps. You know, there's a beautiful passage. I keep using that word beautiful. It's a beautiful word. (laughs) Uh, But in Revelation chapter 19, and I think this is just a great way to end this study. Uh, And here you have the the vision of what's going on in heaven. Mm -hmm. And in Revelation 19, we get just a glimpse of that beginning in verse six. Let me just read that. And then I want us to pray for those who've been joining us in this study. Uh, The scripture says, then this is the apostle John speaking. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder crying out, hallelujah, for the Lord, our God, the almighty reigns. Mm -hmm. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Mm -hmm. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And as Mm. I read that, Mary, I'm spellbound by that vision of what is yet to come, the the consummation of all of God's great redemptive plan. And the part that we as women can have in shining a spotlight on that story, on Mm. the bride part of that story and saying there's something far better yet to come. And our lives can create hunger and thirst and credibility for that great story. And adorn the gospel of Jesus Christ. And oh Lord, how we pray that that might be so. Thank you for the beauty of your ways for the beauty of Christ, for the beauty of the gospel. And Lord, make it real in us. Make it real through us. Mm. And as we behold your beauty, behold your glory, may we be transfigured into that same image. And then may others see and say, I want to know that Savior. Mm. And may our lives create a hunger and an anticipation for that wedding yet to come. May we as your women be a picture of the beauty of that bride. And may all of it point to Jesus, our great, amazing, incredible bridegroom. We pray in Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen.